pleased to see you all around. Um, so indeed, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the experience using Bionano for the last couple of months, actually. So it's obviously very new, uh, but we're getting very excited about it. And I think there's uh, really a, a way of thinking about Bionano as a possibility of truly next generation cytogenetics. Uh, just for full disclosure, some of the data I'll show you today were, were generated truly in a collaborative effort between us and Bionano, and we shared some reagent costs. As you already heard, I come from Nijmegen, not originally, but now I'm there for 12 years, uh, and decided to stay for a bit longer for sure. Um, it's the oldest city of the Netherlands if you never visited it, and it's very close to the German border, where I'm originally from. And just one slide background on what our department does. These are some numbers of our departments. It's quite a big department with uh, roughly 400 uh, people working there. And I think a strategy of Han Brunner, the head of our department, was always to keep all the three divisions that are important to human genetics, uh, keep them all on one rooftop and really have very uh, huge interaction between clinical genetics, our diagnostic unit, which we call genome diagnostics, and our research unit where I work, uh, which we call genome research. Um, just to give you a flavor for our diagnostic throughput, uh, on a yearly basis, we do uh, more than 25,000 DNA isolations. We still continue to do three to 4,000 CNV microarrays every year and 8,000 exomes every year, uh, several thousand MIP assays for, for more targeted resequencing. But importantly, together with the lab for tumor genetics, that's a joint lab between human genetics and pathology, we also continue uh, to test a lot of samples, leukemias and breast cancer samples or breast cancer for point mutations and leukemias for cytogenetic abnormalities and point mutations together. Uh, and there we still continue to do a lot of arrays in addition and also a lot of cytogenetic tests. So when I'm asked to explain what BioNano can now do, uh, I think I, I usually try to refer to karyotyping to start with. What you see here are, is just a nice pair of chromosome 1. Uh, and I was originally trained in Germany in the cytogenetics lab, and if, if you just look at one band, and if you're highly skilled and trained, you can recognize these bands quite accurately, but with really high resolution, you can see that those bands are usually around five megabases in size, and if you're well trained, you may discover a large deletion if such a band is deleted. If a somewhat fainter band is deleted, the whole trick becomes already a bit more tricky. Um, but overall, I think we could agree that there is a resolution for structure variants that's somewhere in the range of the size of a band, so probably 5 to 10 megabases if you are doing a good job. So if you now uh, just imagine a scenario where you could just zoom in in each and every band of a GTG banded chromosome and really just zoom in a little bit more and imagine each and every band would have 1,000 subbands, uh, then you would do really cytogenetics and karyotyping at super high resolution. And that, in essence, is what BioNano can do. So each and every band has 1,000 subbands. And in total, actually, it is cytogenetics just with a 10,000-fold improved sensitivity. And it is fully automated. And some parts, like the library prep or the DNA isolation, is at least automatable at some stage, I think. Um, but it still brings you all the advantages of karyotyping. It still is a genome-wide analysis without any biases. It gives you positional information, and it also gives you a single molecule resolution. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's just cytogenase on pure steroids. Um, and we got excited about that and then uh, got an instrument in our lab. And this is truly just a screenshot from the very first run we ever performed in-house on the BioNano and the new Sapphire instrument that Sven just alluded to. Um, and what you can just see here, that's the real data. So here we just generated coverage, genome-wide coverage of close to 400-fold. So we hit the specs quite, quite exactly at the first run. Uh, those were samples that were derived from EDTA uh, blood. Uh, we generated up to 1.3 terabases per sample. The average size is exactly as Swen presented, quite well on specs, 265 kilo base pairs on average. And we, as I said, generated 375-fold genome coverage in this case. Just to show you some real data, that was really just from the training run, which was performed end of February. <clears throat> when I'm also asked quite a bit, why did you now decide to, to go for BioNano? You obviously also have quite a sequencing fleet in Nijmegen, short reads, long reads, and so on. Uh, and I just like highlight some of the reasons why we decided to do so. Uh, I know the BioNano folks for many years, but I kept on telling them it's not quite as useful yet in our lab. We want to do it in a more medical uh, field and apply it there. So we need higher throughput and lower costs and so on. And that's what's summarized here. So the, the DNA isolation protocol that Sven alluded to 
was really one of the key elements. Now we can isolate 12 samples a day by just one person, and we're in discussion with several companies to try to automate that further in conjunction with BioNano. So, but for now, it's this um, liquid-based isolation called SP protocol, and we can do 12 samples a day. Um, the additional label density that the new system arrived uh, really uh, was also very convincing. Now it's 500,000 bands, if you wish, in the genome. So that is giving us pretty high resolution down to 500 base pairs, as Sven said. Um, and the throughput has become much higher than the previous versions of the instrument. So now it's for constitutional aberrations, six samples on a day. And if you want to go deeper to detect um, somatic events in a, in a cancer genome or in a leukemia genome, then you can uh, simply leave the machine on uh, for a little bit longer. And then after two days, you can uh, have data, high coverage data for six samples. Um, the pricing, obviously, is, is, is important as well. Now we're down to a price of $500 per sample, and there is a possibility that uh, that may drop in the, in the future. Uh, and that, obviously, gets even more interesting then. There's some extra features that I like. I think uh, Bionano really has done quite a good job in optimizing their software analysis. So it's now quite array-like uh, how you look at the data. It's really just clicking a few buttons instead of getting an entire fleet of bioinformaticians in that analyze your your data. Um, very convincing, at least for the applications that we had in mind, uh, was that the high coverage on this instrument now can also find uh, subclonal events in leukemia or other cancer genomes. And to me, it looks very complementary to all the sequencing efforts that we invested in over the last years. Um, the overall goal and the reason why we got this instrument is truly to replace cytogenics as we've done it so far. So that would be replacing karyotyping fish and CNVs, ideally all in one go. All right, um, so those were some arguments, but some real arguments obviously came also from the first sample. So those were four samples that we sent away, I think uh, somewhere end of last year. Uh, so those were uh, bone marrow cells that, that we sent over and by another, the DNA isolation labeling and then also run the samples on their instrument in San, uh, San Diego. And we got the data back and, and you'll see a summary here. So those were data where the coverage was not quite as high as on, uh, on the latest chips, uh, so that was 140-fold genome coverage, but the molecular size was exactly as you've seen before. And these are the overall numbers of all the structural variants seen per genome. So those are four leukemia samples. So that's a mix, obviously, of germline events and some acquired somatic events, all summed up here. Um, but in overall numbers, it's somewhere in the range of five to 6,000 structural variants we see in a genome. Uh, and we now have quite good evidence that actually the vast majority of those are true events. Uh, so I think the false positive rate compared to other technologies is extremely low. Um, what is striking, if you talk about leukemia, is already that we see several translocations. Um, obviously, those could be potentially really imp important for leukemia because those drive leukemia. Um, I'll just highlight two of those examples now in a bit more detail. But just for those uh, I can't wait, uh, the easy message to convey is that all previously identified clinically relevant structural variants and CNVs in all these four samples were simply found back. Uh, and that was based on a combination of karyotyping, CNV microarrays, and fish. And just to show you a bit more details on that, uh, case one was a CML case. Those in the, in the audience that work on, on, on such a disease obviously uh, may directly know what that may lead to. Here we see a three-way translocations involving the chromosomes 9, 14, and 22. So that actually uh, is something we directly spotted back in the circus plot just by clicking a few times on the button you get these kind of data, and in the middle part of the circus plot, you see all these translocations. So there's uh, quite easily three purple lines connecting the chromosomes 9, 14, and 22, and those that work on leukemia know, oh, that must be a Philadelphia chromosome, uh, and because that is really the, the hallmark aberration that drives CML. Um, usually, it's a two-way translocation, 9, 22, which is really common for CML. These kind of three-way translocations are extremely rare, but they nicely just jump out of this software. And the nice bit is you just click on these translocations and they directly see where the breakprints were. And this is obviously the hallmark operation there. So if you look at the translocation uh, 922, what we see here is the reference 9. This is the reference 22. And this is the map assembled of the molecules of this particular sample. And here you will see that you see these uh, faint lines here that align this molecule uh, or the molecular map quite exactly to 9 here to 22, and right in the middle is most likely the breakpoint. And that, not by chance, is right uh, at the fusion between BCR and ABLE, which is the Philadelphia chromosome. 
The nice bit is you can also zoom in, click on the map here, and then all the molecules that build up the map really support what you're seeing there, and you get a fairly good flavor of whether that is multiple molecules that support this event, um, and, uh, uh, and that basically already confirms it. The nice bit is we can just go back to the circus plot, and then we see also all the other breakpoints of the translocation in that sample. Uh, so that was fairly, uh, fairly convincing when we saw it for the first time. Just a second example, here we had a case that had a derivative chromosome uh, two in a, based on a translocation one, two. Um, in carry typing, I would dare, uh, not dare to say that you can see really something in there, especially if it's these blurry bands at not so high resolution. But there may be something going on in this chromosome too. Uh, actually, the, the, the real trick not only came from this carry typing, which potentially could find these kind of translocations and the quality would be a bit higher, but then if you add an array on top, which we do a lot in diagnostics for leukemia, then we see actually that we have a partial gain on chromosome one and a partial loss on two. And bringing these two informations together, yes, you could really come to the conclusion there's an unbalanced translocation uh, by combining these two tests. By using SNP microarrays, which we do in the diagnostics, we can also actually estimate that, that there is a leukemia cell content of roughly 50%. Now, we also took residual material of this sample, put it on by banana, and what you directly see here is a circus plot just showing you the affected chromosomes one and two. So again, you see a nice translocation here, but importantly, in the same view, you can check out this blue line here, which gives you the C and V profile, and there we directly spot the deletion, uh, the partial deletion and the partial duplication. So that directly tells you in one experiment that we truly have an unbalanced translocation, which led to the netto gain and loss of material in roughly 50% of all cells in this case. And again, we can zoom into the breakpoint of the translocation, although in this case, I think it's really the loss and the gain of material which may drive this case and this uh, leukemia in this particular case. Um, and then in addition, actually, we found a second translocation in this very same sample, uh, and that is actually translocation between chromosomes five and 14. So we initially knew from karyotyping that there may something be going on, but we didn't know the exact breakpoints for this case. Um, but then uh, we looked into the bio-nano data, and in addition, our diagnostic lab then performed FISH and confirmed this event as truly being a novel translocation that initially wasn't spotted. Right. So those were the first two samples where we did the proof of concept. Now we, we worked a little bit, little bit more on, on novel cases since ever then, since we really have the instrument in Nijmegen. And I can tell you that we've done a total of 60 samples, mainly done by Tuomo and Connie, also here in the audience. Um, those are 60 samples, four early access that I've shown you before, sent to San Diego, all the others done in IMING. We had some training samples, some research samples, but I want to really focus today are these, uh, or some of the 32 samples uh, that are now part of a clinical validation study. And for that, I'll just start with a very new case that we just very recently analyzed. Here, uh, we had a chronic uh, myeloproliferative uh, neoplasm case with a quite um, a complex deletion seemingly from the array diagnostics. Um, from that, we can also see that it's only 70% aberrant cells, so uh, varying the frequency of around 35% or so. Also that one, we run on BioNano. Again, we'll just have a look at the circus plot. So this is the whole genome view. If I zoom in, these are the two affected, uh, this is the chromosome 20 on this side, but what we, I directly spotted, and that was known before, there's also a translocation uh, with chromosome three. If you then zoomed into the details, this is chromosome 20. And again, this upper profile is the CNV profile, which by and large resembles what we saw in the array. But what is nice, and also Sven alluded to that, the real power really comes from this uh, molecular map. So those are all the molecules, the apparent molecules that don't perfectly match the reference. Uh, but that's de novo assembled from all the apparent molecules in there. And that's basically breakpoint or deletion spanning molecules that assemble in a map. So they heavily support uh, the deletion events that are ongoing in this chromosome. And because it maps to multiple positions of chromosome 20, you already know that it's a more complex deletion event ongoing here. Uh, but then we also, there was, uh, if you just zoom in, I think that was this region. What we also spotted there is actually the CNV profile had additional cores in there. Uh, I had, sorry, additional dips in the CNV profile, but it wasn't yet called. Um, so we had to come to the conclusion that there were some subclonal events that were uh, uh, not called, but were in principle visible. Then actually the good news came, uh, BioNano just launched a novel tool, uh, I think it's now three days ago, 
Uh, we reanalyzed the data, had early access to that tool via Bionano, and the good news is, yeah, then the profile looks slightly different. So yeah, if you would carefully look, there is some more additional deletions on chromosome 20, but importantly, also the translocation to 3 looks a bit more complex. And I'll just zoom into that on the next slide here. Um, and that is actually uh, some of the deletions that initially uh, were not found. The beauty now of the novel tool, which is called the rare variant tool, if I'm correct, um, there actually we have many more of the molecules that support the event. So we really have always these two independent algorithms supporting an event. So it's the CNB profile that is coverage based, but in addition we have these maps much more accurately really spanning the deletion containing molecules. Um, so, so that is uh, very nice. This tool, at least from uh, very quickly looking at the data that we now have, seems to give us much higher sensitivity for somatic structural variants and CNVs. It helps, it gives us better visualization. Um, and uh, very importantly, there is these deletion spanning molecules that really are assembled in maps. And that is really quite strong in the analysis. Um, I, I've shown you on the previous slide that there's a deletion found, uh, thanks to the new analysis, uh, based on the translocation to chromosome 3. If we zoom in into that, indeed, there is a deletion. Again, we have these overlapping maps supporting that, so it must be a true event. And if we zoom in, that is a deletion spanning FOXP1. Now, that is not an, a gene which is really on our diagnostic leukemia list, but there's some recent literature that translocations and maybe even losses and loss of function mutations somatically may be involved in, in different cancer types. So it could be interesting to, to, to look into that, whether this small deletion which initially was missed may also have to do uh, with a phenotype uh, of this leukemia case. So for this case, I, I would uh, summarize that this is not just a complex deletion on chromosome uh, 20. No, it actually is a most likely chromotriptic event evolving chromosomes 3 and chromosome 20. Uh, so it's much more complex than we initially thought. And I think only a more uh, full assessment of what is really going on by combining translocation, structure variants, and so on, uh, we really understand uh, the, the truth which is ongoing in this leukemia sample. Um, while we were doing this, we also in several samples spotted some uh, new translocations that led to potentially new fusions. So here's just one example. So this is a fusion that we initially didn't pick up in our diagnostic analysis of one of the CLL cases, but it is already a, a fusion that has been reported in literature and in other labs before. Uh, but that just reminded us um, that it is now really possible to find novel fusions, hence potentially novel drivers for leukemia, some of which are, are simply missed as this case before, uh, some others may be novel translocations or fusions in previously described uh, driver genes. So probably their interpretation is also a little bit easier. But it, as a researcher, what is really exciting is that sometimes we find completely novel fusions that haven't been reported. And still, we, we get those quite easily. By just clicking a few times, we really see them jumping out of the software. Just keep in mind, I, I worked in a lab before where we did a lot of multicolor fish and then tried to really map breakpoints uh, of translocations and so on. Uh, this is now really possible in, in, in just a single analysis. Um, obviously, once you have these novel fusion, the, the scientifically exciting bits start. I would say you could just quite easily follow up by breakpoint spinning PCRs based on the maps that we now have, uh, maybe analyze on RNA level, and ideally you would show recurrences in other leukemia samples of the same diagnosis. Um, all right. All of that. I, led to the decision to do a real proof of concept study and a proof of principle study in a, in a, a clinical setting. For that, we, we thought we need 150 samples where we perform this long read mapping, and those are 100 leukemia samples, and I just showed you two of those examples from that. 19 of such are done so far in the last couple of weeks. Um, and all of those samples usually analyzed by karyotyping and or a fish and a race. And we simply just do those for 100 cases that come into our setup uh, we take the residual material we have and simply compare it. So I think after a series of 100, we should get a pretty good feeling uh, where we are, how much we find, how much we may miss, um, and how much extra we may find from these 100 samples. In addition, we also see quite an opportunity to use the very same technology uh, to also look into constitutional cytogenetic aberrations. <laughs> There we just selected a bunch of different types of, of these aberrations, and 17 of those cases have been done so far, and I'll show you just a high-level summary of, of some of that. I think if such a study is successful, we ourselves um, would thrive to really use that then clinically, and I think there's a chance to really implement that in a diagnostic setup within a year from now. 
uh, to really have the goal to replace all the classical methods being karyotyping fission array. Just to highlight to you, to, uh, for you two of the constitutional aberration cases, just, uh, we just looked into some of the cases where we found initially um, disease-causing microdeletions and microduplications. So here we have one case uh, where there was a known 8P22 loss um, by just applying quite simple filters, uh, actually the, the, the circus plot looks really different from what I've shown you for the leukemia cases. Obviously there's no translocations in such a case, but there's also just very few SV calls um, in the circus plot just by applying some frequency filters. And then importantly, if we zoom in to, to chromosome eight, uh, then we directly see in the C and V profile a dip in the profile confirming the deletion but even more powerful, if you then look into the map, the map really confirms that. And I think that's the key strength of BioNano to get these two independent signals. For some samples, uh, this is uh, a case of the uh, famous 22Q11.2 loss, um, uh, which again will be presented in a much more fancy way. There, um, uh, we did the same. We see a similar amount of variance that we have to look into, but if you look into chromosome 22, then in this case, we saw that the C and V profile well uh, supported that event, so it was a clear, clearly called microdeletion, but the map got a bit confused there because I think this is one of the most difficult regions of the human genome with all the boundary segmental duplication, so that was not easily supported by the map. We're reassembling that with only using the longest molecule, so I'm carefully optimistic that we really got there, but in this case, the map didn't really show us immediately the event, but the CNV profile recovered that, so um, that was good news from that end. Um, just to give you the highlight uh, of the samples that we've run so far, so for leukemia, um, I, I'm <laughs> excited to tell you that all the clinically reported variants that we found in the samples that we analyzed so far have been uh, really found back, uh, as long as they had an allelic fraction more than 10%. Uh, and I think um, probably further improvements of the software and even higher coverage may probably help us to even find lower fractions in there. Um, what we also witnessed is that a lot of the rearrangements that we initially spotted by either karyotyping or race or the combination of such, uh, actually a lot of those events are more complex than we initially thought. For the constitutional aberrations, we only did 17 of the 50 that we aim to do. Uh, also there we found all the known aberrations back, and just as a highlight for the microdeletion duplications, also all of those were, were found back, but just for full disclosure, usually they are found, as in the first example I've shown you, by the map and the CNV tool, but we had a total of uh, 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 three cases. In one case, the map only found the event. There, the simple reason is the CNV tool is really sensitive from 500 KB and onwards. Um, so that was missed, but clearly supported by the map. But we two others, as the 20DQ1 example, where the boundary uh, uh, repetitive nature of the genomic region was not able to really dissolve it directly in the map, but the CNV tool of the software really supported it. Um, as a scientist, I'm now also, uh, very excited that we start to, to include some research samples. Just think of some of the families where you have a map locus uh, and none of the sequencing devices really uh, resolve those. I think there by Nana really may have a space. I, in, in particular, I think there will be some inversions in the genomes that other technologies simply missed that may explain disease, and that could be for linkage regions, but it could also be for recessive disease where you already know of a point mutation, but you simply haven't found the mutation in the second allele, I think there is something to be found uh, using this kind of technology. Um, and obviously we ourselves are engaged in several programs for, for uns solving unsolved rare diseases, and I think there again, optical mapping could play a nice role in there. And then I'd just like to finalize, uh, but I'd like to highlight one more thing that's not even from, from our lab. Actually the Sapphire instrument has a second laser in, uh, included in it basically for free, uh, while we're not actively using it yet, it has a potential to do a few extra things. One of which is that uh, we could simply barcode. So we actually could just merge two samples by having a red label and a green label, uh, and that basically would have the price or almost have the price. So that could be exciting and, and hopefully that is coming sometime soon. Um, you could also use the second laser to uh, have a second label and potentially get a higher resolution or map any kind of other elements in the DNA if you have a smart label for that. Uh, one of such example is actually a recent paper uh, from uh, Yuval Ebenstein's lab, and they used the second color of the instrument uh, by uh, 
working on a on a on the label for methylated sites of the genome. It's just published in genome research. Just look at that. But it's really nice that you now get all the structural information. And in a phase, you can see whether that is in cis or trans with any kind of methylation marks. I think that could potentially be interesting for, for germline events, but also for some of the somatic events in cancer. So with that, I'd like to uh, summarize. I, I truly believe that there is a chance that optical mapping allows a, a revolution in cytogenetics by really kicking out all the old school technologies uh, and, and delivering higher resolution and higher throughput. Um, uh, I think that may actually already happen within the next year or two. Uh, just to summarize our findings so far, the good news is we found all previously identified clinically relevant structural variants back, uh, as long as I had an allele fraction higher than 10%, and especially the latest instrument and the very high coverage up to 400-fold really improves uh, also our calling of somatic structural variants. Uh, and the tool we just received to, uh, the first data of uh, two days ago is actually exciting and really helping uh, this sensitivity quite a bit. Uh, I think it also opens novel opportunities for research, as I try to highlight on the next, uh, last one or two slides. Um, and I'm quite excited that there are several groups around the globe that really play with these kind of instruments now and make some additional scientific progress uh, applying uh, other and novel labels. With that, uh, I'm at the end of the, of the presentation, in particular, I want to thank all the lab team involved in, in this work in Nijmegen. Here you see some of our lab crew getting really excited about uh, the lab training on BioNano. I'd like to thank everybody at the BioNano team for all their support throughout the last uh, couple of weeks and months. And in particular, uh, Tuomo and Cornelia are also in the room and did a lot of work on this project. So uh, with that, uh, I'd be very happy to take some questions. I think I should disclose that this uh, is a research use only, although I got excited about some of the clinical and diagnostic applications. And just uh, a famous scientist passed away this year, but he came up with this citation. Uh, and I think it is still very true. Thank you very much for your attention.